morning, and thank you for joining us to discuss the draft 2023 Flexible Capacity Needs and Availability Assessment Hours Technical Study. My name is Elisandra Casillas, representing the Stakeholder Affairs Group here at the California ISO, and I will be facilitating today's meeting. And I'm also joined by Kai Lu Tan, Principal of Renewable Energy Integration, Hong Zhu, Lead Market Development Analyst, Short-Term Forecasting, and Jessica Tahari, Energy Meteorologist, short-term forecasting. This presentation and other materials related can be found on the recurring process webpage. Next slide, please. Some housekeeping reminders, this call is being recorded and the video file will be posted on the initiative webpage for information and convenience purposes only. The recordings and any related transcriptions should not be reprinted without the ISO's permission. The meeting is structured to stimulate dialogue and engage different perspectives. Please keep comments professional and respectful. Also, please try and be brief and refrain from repeating what has already been said so we can manage the time efficiently. Next slide, please. Instructions for questions. We will pause for questions periodically throughout the meeting. You can raise your hand by selecting the hand icon above the chat window in WebEx. Or if you've joined via audio only, please press pound two on your device. Please remember to state your name and affiliation before making your comments. You may also send your question via chat to all panelists. If you need technical assistance during today's meeting, please feel free to send a chat to the event producer. Next slide, please. The purpose of today's call is to discuss the assumptions, methodology, and draft results of the monthly flexible capacity requirement and availability assessment hours technical study, specifically calculating monthly flexible capacity requirements for all LRAs within the ISO's footprint for RA compliance year 2023, and advisory requirements for compliance years 2024 and 2025. Next slide, please. For today's agenda, after my introduction, we will begin with the process review, expected build out from all LSCs, CPUC, jurisdictional, and non I'm sorry, juridic, juridic, ooh, it's a word today, juridic, juridic, jurisdictional, uh, load, wind, and solar profiles, calculate three hour net load upward ramp, add the larger of either the spinning reserve portion of the contingency reserve or the most severe contingency, calculate monthly flexible capacity requirements, following with an overview of methodology used for system, local availability assessment hours, 2023 availability assessment hours, and 2024, 2025 draft availability assessment hours. And from here, I will now turn it over to Clyde Lutan. So um, when we had the initial call back in January, um, this is slide six. Okay, so when we had the initial call back in, in January, um, we mentioned that we sent out a survey to all those serving entity scheduling coordinators to fill out the expected uh, flexible capacity um, installation. And by that, we look for partial, um, you know, either the, uh, a whole wind or solar plant or part of that plant or whatever contracts they have for renewables. So we collect that information and um, our next slide, please. So, on, so go back to the previous slide. Um, this is a new slide that I um, uh, the previous one was uh, page six. Okay, so page six was, was page five in my original deck. But um, so we start off with the CEC IPA forecast, um, and we look at years 23 through 25. And also, you know, we collect that uh, survey that we sent out in December, uh, in January, and we go through that and look at the capacity installation for all LSCs. Um, and then uh, we determine the net load, the flex capacity needs uh, based on 
internal uh, vote capacity. We also look at the dynamic schedules coming into the ISO. And uh, last year, we started off looking at the co-located resources. And this year, we had added the hybrid resources into this flex capacity analysis. So uh, with that, uh, can we move on to slide um, eight? So collecting that data, this plot here shows um, the existing renewables within the ISO's uh, footprint. So as you can see, um, wind is pretty much flat, which is that green, and it's about, you know, 4,200, 4,300 megawatts. Across the board, we're looking at about, you know, 4,500 megawatts in um, 2023 time frame, and then it's almost 18,000 megawatts uh, total with wind and solar uh, 20, by 2023 time frame. Most of the solar that's coming in, um, and, and this has been the fact over the years, is PV tracking, and then we have a fair amount of uh, fixed PV, and uh, we have very small amounts that's um, not yet determined if they want to be uh, fixed or tracking. And um, with the PV tracking, what we notice is, is the ramp is a little more steeper during uh, sunrise and then it drops off a lot quicker during sunset. So that's one reason why one reason why you can see, you know, larger ramps because we've seen a lot of PV tracking uh, on the system. Oh, and then we have about 800 megawatts of solar thermal that into this uh, resource mix. Uh, next slide, please. We also look at the co-located and hybrid. So uh, the green here shows you the battery portion of um, the co-located. So basically by um, 2023 timeframe, we're looking at about 3,500 megawatts on average of uh, co-located those portion. And then um, for hybrid, it's a little right around 600 megawatts, a little less than 600 megawatts. And then the green, uh, similar to the co-located, shows the battery portion of this hybrid uh, resource. So hybrid co-located, um, these uh, two plots here. Um, next slide, please. So again, going through the data, um, LSTs within the ISO contracted for almost 3,000 megawatts of wind and solar plants external to the ISO. Almost 50% of that external um, uh, contract comes in as fixed uh, static schedules, and the other 50% or so comes in as dynamic schedules. So um, next slide, please. So from the 3,000 megawatts, we're looking at a little over 1,400 megawatts that comes in as dynamic schedules. Again, on this plot, you see wind is pretty much flat, solar is pretty much flat. And what we do when we include the dynamic schedules, we only look at the incremental dynamics. And the reason why we do that is it's pretty hard to tell in real time what's dynamics, what's not dynamics. So when you look at the ISO's load data, the dynamics is better than that load data. The, um, minute by minute variability that we see from the external wind and solar resources is embedded in the load. So hence that's the reason why we only include incremental uh, dynamics when we do uh, this analysis. Uh, next slide, please. And the last piece of information we take from the submitted um, SC in, info is we look at the forecasted uh, behind the meter installation. And as you can see, you know, it's about 11,400 megawatts in 2021. And by 2023, that's going to be almost, um, you know, 1,300, almost 14,000, uh, sorry, 14,000 megawatts. So what's embedded in this study in the CEC's forecast is the production, which is the orange curve. And, uh, this, so this shows the maximum CEC's behind the meter production that went into the CC's load forecast. And uh, for 2023, the maximum uh, production for behind the meter is roughly about, you know, 12,000 megawatts. Uh, with that, I'm gonna pause for a second to see if 
there are any questions on the data submittals and how we use that data to calculate the flexible capacity needs of the system? Reminder for questions, you can raise your hand by selecting the hand icon above the chat window in WebEx. Or if you've joined via audio, please press pound two on your device. Please remember to state your name and affiliation first. And you may also send your question via chat to all panelists. We'll hold just for a minute. Okay, so we can move on to the next slide. So the next slide is a summary, a high level summary of what was submitted. So the very first slide shows, you know, um, and we saw this in the graphs before, 11,261 megawatts that was existing in terms of the solar uh, PV. And we're looking at an increase of about 1,100 megawatts by 2023. Just, this is just solar PV installation. Uh, the solar thermal is pretty much constant. Uh, between 21 and 23. Um, wind, I would say wind, wind is pretty close also, um, just a few hundred megawatts increase. Uh, hybrid resources, um, by 2023, we're looking at uh, around 600 megawatts of uh, hybrid uh, that was included in this uh, FLEX study. And then um, the co-located is, is the bigger one. So we saw about 880 megawatts existing in 2021, and it's expected to see about almost 3,800 megawatts by 2023. The takeaway from this slide, uh, actually two takeaways. One, we talked about the dynamics, even though we had 1,400 megawatts of dynamic schedule, only 204 megawatts of that dynamic schedule was included in um, the flex analysis this year. So uh, the bigger takeaway from this is looking at the incremental between 2021 and 2023. It's about 5,000 megawatts, so about 5,100 megawatts of additional verbs that's included in uh, the analysis. Um, and then the, the, the green really shows you the uh, behind the meter capacity that was submitted by LSEs and the maximum CC production that uh, showed up in the CC's uh, hourly uh, forecast. Uh, with that, let's move on to slide 14. So slide 14 shows you um, the capacity assessment. I think we went over this um, before. What the LSC submits is for each wind and solar plant, they look to see, you know, if the whole plant was owned by an LSC or if part of that plant was owned or if they had any contracts with uh, renewables. We see a lot of contracts with the dynamic schedules and that's factored in. And then we, the, the net load, sorry, not the net load, the three hour wrap is really based on the net load. And net load is really important. In the past, balancing authorities or um, way, way back in the past, control areas used to balance to meet load. Today, we balance to meet uh, net load variability. So we generate the net load profiles for 2022, 2023, 2024, and 2025. Um, so 2023 is the binding year in this case, and we show advisory ramps the 2024 and uh, 2025. Uh, next slide, please. So I'll go over this slide and then we'll pause to see if there are any questions. So we started we started off by taking the CCs one into ICO forecast. And the link to that forecast is shown at the very top. Um, and so that's the CD 2021 hourly forecast. And then we use the mid, mid base AAEE and AAFS. And the, the column that we use is column U, which is the manage net load. And there's two things that's um, included there. One is the additional achievable energy efficiency. And the second is the additional achievable fuel uh, substitution. So those two things go in um, to the base net load 
And then what we did is we show what the base net load is from that PC uh, hourly spreadsheet. So the base net load is comprised of the base consumption, which is color man. And then color man has a few things that are included to come up with the base net load. So you look at behind the meter PV storage and you look at uh, residential, non-storage residential to come up with a uh, base net load. Um, so if you look at this backwards, you see uh, base consumption and then uh, what goes into base consumption to come up with base net load and then what's added on to base net load to come up with managed net load. Um, so all of this comes down to column U and column U is what we use as a CEC's uh, forecast, hourly forecast to do this flexible uh, capacity. Now, a lot of work goes into this coming up with, you know, all of these different um, input data and, um, you know, kudos out to CEC for, you know, going into in depth to calculate or to estimate what that hourly uh, forecast is going to look like. So we take that hourly forecast. Uh, let's go through one more slide that we pause for a second. So slide 16 shows, um, uh, can we go down one more slide please? Yeah, so sl slide 16 shows the CEC's forecast from for, for 2022 through 2025 and the very first bar shows the actual 2021. And you can see it's, it's pretty close except for a couple months. Um, there are some differences, but a couple of things to keep in mind here. One, it's very uncertain because 2020, 2021, you know, um, we went to COVID, a lot of folks were still working from home. And 2023 through 25, if you look at this really close, the increase is not a lot. Um, I think most of that increase in load is offset by behind the meter uh, PV, most of it. So you can see a steady um, increase in the, um, the CC's forecast. So um, let me pause there for a second to see if there are any questions with the input data set, you know, um, either the, the LSC submittal or the CC's uh, hourly forecast that we use. And it looks like we have one caller in the queue. Okay. Hi, Clyde. This is uh, Chris Devin from Customized Energy Solutions. Can you hear me all right? Hi, Chris. Yes. Okay, thanks for the presentation. Um, I just wanted to uh, see if you guys had given any additional thought to um, some of our prior input about the hybrid resources and co-located resources and the treatment of that in these, these flex studies. Um, just because, you know, last time I was kind of indicating that I, I was hopeful that Kaiso would consider maybe using the actual um, historical output data from those resources as opposed to just the renewable component, um, since they are kind of dispatched by the market, more like a traditional resource. Um, but, uh, you know, happy to talk about it more offline, but I was just curious if you guys had any reaction to that um, so far through the process. So, so, Chris, uh, that's a good question. I know you have mentioned that before, but after this go around, what we plan on doing internally here at the ISO is to look at all of the, the um, also look at the, the methodology, not only the co-located and the hybrid, but other things that we need to really look at to modify uh, the flex capacity moving forward. So that's something that we would incorporate, you know, after, after this study. Okay, that's that's encouraging to hear that you guys might open that up a little bit further um, for, for more discussion in the next cycle. So I, I think we can, you know, engage again um, for the next time. And I, I would just note that I, it does appear that we're getting more and more of those resources on the system. So um, in the future, I think it'll just become more important, but, but thanks for the uh, response. Okay, well, thank you. This is, this, is, this is Amber, Chris, just to expand a little bit too. Um, the hybrid resources, as you know, are newer coming on the system, and we're going to be able to receive more data points 
from those resources when the technology deployment of hybrid phase two happens. Right now that's set for fall of this year. Um, so we're gonna continue to monitor the hybrid resources, the current position that we've taken, as well as all of those additional components as we get that data. Um, but a lot of that data is not gonna come in for us to be able to really dive deep until fall of 2022. Um, so I do wanna point that out too. Um, right now, um, that, that whole project is not deployed um, on the technical side. Yeah, but we'll so continue thanks, to watch that, That's helpful too. Um, I, I definitely appreciate that. Um, once you guys get that dynamic limit tool in, I think they'll provide more flexibility for those resources to kind of control their um, dispatch to how much they want to charge and how much, you know, renewable output there is. So they'll look less like a traditional renewable and more like a traditional generator um, that, that's more dispatchable. So anyhow, that, that sounds great. And, and I'm encouraged to hear that you guys are thinking about it. So I will stop bugging you guys until the next uh, next time is more appropriate for, for this and the, the full cycle. And once you guys get some more data, you know, I, I appreciate the, the numbers that, that you presented as far as the, the penetration levels and it looks like well, you know, right now there's not very many and in the future there'll be a lot more. So it certainly makes sense. Thanks, Amber. Uh, Dr. Zab, is that it? Yes, there are no callers in the queue. Please proceed. Okay, let's move on to the next slide. So slide 17. Um, this is going back to the CC's uh, load forecast. So as I mentioned, CC submit an hourly forecast, and you can look at, at this plot here, let's say for um, any given day. So uh, the blue is the hourly CC forecast, and then the um, green curve is the actual one minute ISO's um, uh, net load. Uh, sorry, so load for, for this um, particular, let's say this is a day. So then what we do is we um, calculate the hourly average um, for the actual one minute ISO's load. And um, if you look at step one, uh, what it is really is looking at the CC's hourly forecast and the ISO's actual one minute uh, load data. And then what we do is we look at the delta between uh, both. And the delta between both is really that um, purple line. And the purple line looks straight, but then if you change the y-axis, uh, step two, that's what that purple line looks like. So it's a difference between each hour. And then what we do is uh, we try to smoothen that um, CC hourly forecast and we, we run that through a smoothening uh, routine, and then we end up with that orange uh, one minute uh, curve. So at no point does that one minute curve exceed the CC's um, forecast. And then um, if you look at step three, step three is really uh, taking the ISO's um, one minute data and adding in that, that um, orange, one minute uh, change so that we can align that or, or convert that into a one minute CC forecast. So uh, next slide shows you the CC load forecast. Um, it's uh, next slide please shows you uh, taking this info and showing it as an, an equation as to, to what's really being done. Uh, so can we move on to the next slide, please? So this is what we do. We look at the, the actual one minute data for 2021. And for each minute, we have an X, right? And that X is really that orange curve in the previous plot that we add to the 2021 data, or we subtract from the 21 uh, data to come up with uh, 2023 profile. We do that for you know, 2023, 2024, 2025, but the um, procedure is the same, and it's just to smoothen out an hourly profile into a uh, minute-by-minute profile. Because when we look at um, the three-hour ramp, 
you're really interested in across that three hour, minute one through minute 180, uh, as opposed to, you know, hourly averages. So um, with that, I'm gonna pause here for another second to see if anyone has any questions on how we trade the CC's uh, load forecast. Are no callers in the queue? Okay, then let's move on to slide uh, 19. So slide 19, so, so we talked about the load, how we trade the load. And then we look at the solar and wind. So the solar uh, growth assumption is we take that LSC submitted. So the reason why we ask for the current year, so like in 20, the end of 2021, when we submitted that, um, uh, the survey to LSC, so LSC is a scheduling coordinator, we asked for the capacity that was existing in 2021. So we know what the capacity was in 2021, and then the expected capacity for the subsequent years, we know what that um, capacity is. And what we do is we do a simple scale. So we take the one minute uh, data for, let's look at 2023, so we look at the one minute solar profile, and we multiply that by the capacity in 2023, divided by the capacity in 2021, and this shows the minute by minute growth that you would expect. Uh, the reason why we think this is um, uh, a reasonable way of looking at the solar growth or the wind growth is the amount of capacity we have existing on the system, right? So uh, with 12,000 megawatts uh, existing, an additional, you know, a few hundred megawatts in solar and a few hundred megawatts of wind, we think uh, the capacity, this, this methodology, you know, it, it, it holds and um, the chances for error is small. Now, um, so we do this, something similar for wind. So wind and solar, uh, the exact uh, formula that we use. Now, I know some of you um, look at other entities and would say, you know, well, um, when you look at this methodology, we would see an increase in, in wind. But we look at the whole thing, we look at wind, we look at solar, and then we have a lot of dynamic schedules, right? But if you look at it, like, let's say, OCA, for example, and you look at only the, their wind capacity, you know, it, it's such geographically dispersed, they do see um, a reduction in flexible capacity with more and more wind. Uh, we here uh, see just the opposite when we have uh, so much solar on the system, right? And just one piece of information, we um, there are studies that were done. One of the biggest studies was done by Carnegie Mellon, and I think I've mentioned this in the past, where they look at the variability between wind and solar. Um, one of the things that they concluded is beyond five to seven solar plants you see no reduction in flexibility. So it just increases. Hence, that's why the ISO flexible capacity needs is increasing as we um, install more and more uh, solar onto the system. And the other unknown here too is really um, a rooftop or behind the meter rooftop PV. So uh, next slide, please. So um, we, the previous slide was solar. We do the similar um, uh, scaling for wind, and then we calculate net load. And we start with the net load. Net load is really a not defined term, which is looking at your load minus wind minus uh, uh, the solar production. And the um, reason why you want to look at net load, as I said, we dispatch to meet net load today net load is more variable than load itself or wind itself, um, you see a lot, a lot of variability. So um, that's the reason why we base that three-hour ramp on net load because of that variability that we see. So slide uh, 21 shows, going through uh, one more thing that we add is, uh, so the, the previous slides talked about the, the three-hour round. So then we come up with the flexible capacity requirement by taking that three-hour round and then looking at 
the maximum of either the most severe single contingency or roughly 3.5% of the expected peak load for that month. And then um, we had included over the years that epsilon. We never really implemented that, but the intent there was to see how far off the flexible capacity was and then, then apply that um, epsilon value. So um, this is how we calculate the flexible capacity requirement. And then this is what Hong uses to do his allocation, uh, the flexible capacity requirement. And he's going to get uh, into the details as to how he does that. Uh, so slide 22 shows um, the three-hour ramp on the flexible capacity uh, needs for 2023 based on the submitted data and the CC forecast. Um, looking at this, you know, um, well, it's hard to really compare, but um, if we look at slide 23, so again, on this slide, the orange is what Hong would use to do his allocation. Now, this slide here, we, we did a comparison uh, looking at the uh, forecast for 2023 and the advisory for 24 and 25. And the the blue, the very first bar, is really the actual um, three-hour ramp that we saw in 2021. And then 2022 is the three months so far in 2022. So those are actual three-hour ramps. And when you, when you compare that to uh, 23, 24, 25, you can see um, it, it, it's different by quite a bit. So what we did is we looked to see if we can explain why. And again, these are transition years because of COVID in 2021. But what short-term forecasting um, was able to come up with is we saw abnormal temperatures, uh, higher temperatures in January, February of 2021. That could reduce the, the ramps only because now you have higher loads, minus wind, minus solar. You know, so the three-hour uh, ramp would tend to shrink. Also, during the summer months, uh, they noticed, you know, warmer average temperatures during the evening, and that would translate into higher loads in the morning. Uh, with higher loads in the morning, it would reduce the ramps during uh, the summer months. And then um, we saw increased cloud covers, like, during the, the last three months. Of the air, and that could also impact uh, the ramps, the three hour ramp, only because you know, it could impact the, the um, wind and solar uh, production. So, um, when we look at this data, we also need to look at you know, the changes. Not every year is the same. We transitioned in from 2020 and 21, which was you know, COVID, a lot of folks were home, and it's not like a traditional year where that three hour ramp is comprised of the the solar dropping off and the load increasing. And so since most people were home, you don't see that load increase as we used to see it prior to COVID, where, you know, when folks went home and they start doing uh, or using the electricity, you, you had a double whammy there with the load increase and the drop off in solar. So um, uh, that can lead to, to uh, the significant increase that you see. Uh, moving on to slide 24. Uh, slide 24 shows you the flexible capacity. So it's similar to the previous slide. Previous slide shows the three hour ramp. And then all we did is add, added the most severe single contingency or the three and a half percent of the expected load to come up with this plot. So they kind of mirror image. Uh, the only difference is the greater of the MSSC or three and a half percent of uh, expected load. Um, with that, 24, can we move on to slide 25? Oh, on slide 25, um, and I'll stop after the next slide. So slide 25 um, is a pretty interesting slide. We wanted to show 2021 actuals and how that relates to um, forecast. So if you look at what we forecasted for 2022 in 2021, you'd see that green uh, curve. And then you look at this year, what we forecasting for 2023. 
again, you can see, you know, a significant uh, increase. So um, I tried to explain that in the previous slide, but this is what we're looking at. And then one more slide, and then we'll pause for some questions. Uh, slide uh, 26. So slide 26 shows a couple of things, and this is one input also that was not factored into uh, the three hour ramp calculation. So if you look at the blue, the blue is what we have forecasted for 2021. And when you look at the actual three hour ramp, which is that orange, you can see, you know, it's, in some months it's, it's significantly less than um, uh, what we have forecasted. But it's difficult to forecast curtailment a year ahead. So when you factor back what well, we actually curtail in real time, and in real time, we curtail renewables for several reasons, right? Uh, one could be, you know, congestion, two could be controllability. Um, so when you look at uh, curtailing renewables, if you go back and you add what was curtailed, you can see the curtailment brings it up back to pretty close to what was forecast for some months, especially, you know, February is an interesting month, but then when you look at, you know, May, uh, December, you know, they, 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 with the curtailment, it's not that far off. Um, again, I know Chris may have some questions, but this is something we're going to be looking at when we uh, regroup after this uh, go around for uh, future years to see the best way to treat uh, curtailment. Um, so let me pause there for a second to see if there are any questions, because I think I only got two more slides after this, and I'll pass it on to Hans. There are no callers in the queue. Please proceed. Okay, so on to slide 27. So slide 27, um, the reason why we show this slide is really to show the need uh, for speed into um, the system. And the bright side is we have a lot of storage coming in. They're pretty fast, and they can help us meet some of this uh, anticipated three hour ramps. But when you look, and this is looking at the same day, so the blue bars are the three hour maximum ramp days that we saw for each month. And that red dot there really shows you what was the peak for that day. And looking at it, except for the so much, you can see the three hour ramps today is in some, most of the months is greater than 50% of the peak demand, which means to say we try to meet uh, more than 50% of your daily peak in three hours, right? And this is a lot of movement, again, in, um, in three hours. Now, when um, you look at the three-hour ramps and you, then you look at the hourly ramps, and when I look at this data, what I look at is the magnitude of the hourly ramps as opposed to three-hour ramps. And if you add the, the, look at the two, like May and August, it's 49%. But so that's really 10 months, 10 months of the year. What we say is the one hour ramp is at or greater than 50% of the three hour ramp. So what this tells you is the three hour ramp is not evenly distributed across three hours. It means we need a lot of speed. And then when you look at this, this magnitude, it's like seven, 9,000 megawatts in an hour. And that, that's a lot of movement. And this is actual data. This is not uh, a forecast here. This is actual uh, ramp that we saw in 2021. And again, the, the comparison I like to make here is this is several times greater than smud peak demand in an hour, you know, the, the, the uh, summer peak demand. So we try to move, you know, three to four times mud peak demand in an hour, right? So when you think about uh, movement forecasting, is a lot that goes into it to try to meet that ramp. Now, um, and the reason why flexible capacity is important for us too is, is not how well you met your load at the end of an hour or at the end of three hours. And even though we do a five minute dispatch, it's, it's a point, you know, we try to get across. It's not how well you met that load 
at the top of that five minutes within the uh, two to five minute dispatch. But the, the, what the ISO has to comply with is how well we met each minute of that, that, that ramp. So for instance, in five minutes, if the load is increasing by, let's say 500 megawatts, um, we, we, we get that 500 megawatts at the, the last minute, it doesn't help us, we've met the load, but our control performance would be pretty bad. So we got, we got to control this in a way, um, the way we, we report this to NERC is we calculate every minute how well we balance supply and demand. And that's why, you know, when we talk about flexible capacity, we talk about speed on the system, it's, it's only because we get benchmark every minute as to how well we balance supply and demand. So flexible capacity is really important, and this is why, you know, we, we do this um, analysis. Now, if you look at slide 28, slide 28 shows you the curtailment, and you can see um, this is actual curtailment, again, based on 2021 uh, data. Most of the curtailments here were back in, you know, March, April, May time frame, looking at uh, month. And then if you take the same curtailment and you look at it by hour, uh, slide 29, please, it shows you um, basically the curtailment is between sunrise and sunset, um, typically during the middle of the days when we see, you know, maximum oversupply, need for curtailment, and other things in the system. And um, again, you know, it comes down to how well can you control the grid during the middle of the day with minimum uh, dispatching resources online. When um, on, on one point um, I would like to emphasize here is when we balance balance supply and demand, there are other things that we have to comply with, not only just balance and supply and demand. We gotta make sure we have things like uh, reserve, enough reserves on the system. We gotta make sure that we can com comply with three out of NERC standards in real time. Uh, because if we fail one of those, trying to um, uh, balance the system, uh, each one of these failures can come with up to a million dollars in fine per event. So it's pretty expensive and we do not want to have um, a violation, right? Next slide, please. Um, so this next slide here shows you, based on actual 2021 data, if you look at the net load, and this is just looking at seven random days of the month. And the reason why we wanted to show this is two reasons. One, you can see how net load varies uh, from one day to the next, you know, both in the horizontal axis and the vertical axis. And one of the reasons why we want to relook the, this, in the past when we looked at the, the secondary ramp, you know, it used to help. We didn't see that steep belly because we did not have a lot of solar in the system. But when you look at the three hour ramp today, it's really from about three o'clock to your net load peak. You gotta, you gotta meet that. Total three hour ramp now on evening, right? So that morning ramp, whatever it is that you use to help you um, meet that slight increase in demand between, uh, let's say, four or five during sunrise, you're going to deck those units because now the solar comes up at you and you're back down to minimum load. And then that evening ramp is, is the full ramp that you see. The morning ramp does not really help you. Um, now only because we have so much uh, solar on the system. Uh, my last slide, I think, is, is uh, the next slide. Oh, and then one more thing on that, the previous slide. Um, so, so on this slide, it is not, I know a lot of folks say, well, you know, it's easy to predict net load, you know, your solar is pretty much predictable, wind is predictable, well, this is what we are actually in control to, and it's, it's not easy to forecast you know, your net load from one day to the next. Because when you're factoring things like rooftop PV and you're looking at minute by minute um, variability with rooftop PV, it's really, really difficult to guesstimate that, you know, um, accurately. So you do the best you could factor that in, but then controlling, you gotta make sure you have enough flexibility and enough things like regulation to help you uh, fine tune the balancing. So my last slide is, is um, 
just looking at, oh, so slide 31. So slide 31 shows you um, just what we have today. Uh, some of you would remember this, this curve where we had done this in the past. We had estimated by 2020, that's where our ramp was gonna be 13,000 megawatts. And that we had estimated the minimum net load to be 12,000 12, megawatts. Well, you know, we missed that big time. And the biggest reason is we vastly underestimated the rooftop PV installation, um, installation right? So right now, um, last month on the 27th, we saw a minimum net load of 2,874 megawatts. That's pretty low. And um, we saw again last month on um, March 11th, we saw a three hour ramp of 17,660 megawatts. And when you add back curtailment onto this, those numbers, not those numbers, the ramp um, increases. So with that, I'd like to, and this is my last slide, uh, just to see if there are any more questions there, Alexander or Chris. Looks like we have one caller in the queue. Go ahead. Brian, your line is unmuted. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Clyde, this is uh, Brian Baker with Middle River Power. I, I wanted to ask, from the ISIS five-minute data that it that posts on its website, um, it appears that there have been net loads even much, much lower than that, minimum net loads down in the, the 1,000 megawatt range. Um, can, can you confirm that? Have, we, have you seen a net load as low as 1,000 megawatts in early April? No. So, so Brian, the, the net load, so we look at different things here, right? So the net load that we control to, the actual net load that we see, the minimum was 2874. But also, I know on the forecasting side, they also factor in the dynamics that's coming in to, to calculate what that net load would have looked like. So the reason why uh, the numbers look different, again, for uh, real-time operations, right, actual operations, uh, the numbers does not include dynamic imports, right? But when you're looking at the, the, the three hour ramp requirement, this is what it would have been. So for instance, if you have, let's say, um, a thousand megawatts coming in as a dynamic schedule from New Mexico, that may or may not, that, that thousand megawatts may or may not come into the ISO. But we do see the flexibility because uh, you're familiar, Brian, the way we calculate dynamic schedules, right? Because in real time, um, the actual and the schedule is the same, so it cancels out. But we do see the flexibility. So this is why we have to calculate the flexible capacity, including the dynamic. And the reason why we do that, let's say, for some reason, the network topology changes. Let's say you have um, a line out, and we get this full thousand megawatts. This is what we would have seen in terms of ramp. But when I look at it, Rob, I look at what we actually saw. Uh, so that's the biggest difference. Okay, thank you, Clyde. And, and Brian, this is Amber. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is that today's outlook plot, the intent of the today's outlook plot is to show the forecast error of what we're forecasting for. So there are other items, um, such as discretionary pumps, um, battery charging, that are optimized in the market dispatch that are not shown on that visual image because that visual image is to show the forecast of what we're forecasting for and then the error associated with it. So just another thing to keep in mind, if, if those pumps are pumping, that's an additional load. Um, and when we put our records out like Clyde is showing right there, we take into account all of the loads, whether it be the pumping load or the battery charging as well. Okay, thank you, Amber, appreciate that. Is that it, uh, Chris? Yep, looks like Hello. I do not see any more callers in queue. Okay, well, thanks for that question, Brian. 
And I'll, with this, I'll pass it on to Hong. Thank you. Um, thank you, everyone. The, um, I'm going to uh, do the uh, allocation of the primary uh, result of uh, allocation for all the big pie. The client has just uh, uh, showed in the uh, slide 25. So next slide, please. So this is the big pie. Each month I view it as a pie. Uh, so my uh, kind of is a little compared to the uh, compared to um, to class job. My is a little more uh, on the routine side, and it's basically is how to slice and dice all these pies. So uh, before I doing that, I need to uh, uh, we have observed the uh, many LSE has increased their solar profile co-located in the hybrid in next year. And there are some new solars. So that is the mainly the contributor of the increase of 20 or more percent of flexible need because we have really have more solar coming to our market. So the pie, the size is increased. As a result, mainly uh, on average or generally, um, each LSE will uh, expect that their allocation will increase accordingly, 20, 25%, 15% of that type. So that uh, is just a result of all the increase of the profiles in every, um, almost every uh, LSE. So uh, that is. so. My talk is how to slice dice this pie. One way uh, in the uh, slide 23 of the class we present is, uh, hey, we can slice this big pie by uh, one hour ranking and three hour ranking. So this big pie, you have 50% is the uh, is the one hour ranking. So that's one way, for example. So my have a different additional ways to, to view, to give the insight of what really into this big pie. Go to next slide. Thank you. So is, uh, hey, how much each pie, each ball has the uh, load contribution and how much wind contribution and how much solar contribution? That's one way. The uh, you can see the wind and the solar contribution. Wind contribution is uh, kind of uh, uh, varying uh, uh, around the zero because the wind you have never really can predict a year ahead of what that would be. So the trees can be go sideways or either way. So I view, uh, but the solar in the summer is really contributing great deal. Look at the July, you have a three quarters of that uh, uh, reflection need is coming from solar. So, and only 25% of one quarter is from load. So the um, basically the three hour ramp need is uh, to show in all this fatty duck is that uh, afternoon when the sun goes down, the uh, solar generation drops, that's the need. We need to really uh, get the uh, ISO operation stable. So that's the need that we are talking about. So uh, this is the, uh, you can see we have this uh, roughly uh, in the winter and the solar is a little uh, less contribution and the sum is contribution more. So that is not really a kind of common sense, no brainer. Go next. So uh, this is uh, the, what the uh, traditional categories uh, we are doing the, for how much the flexibility and how much uh, this is kind of have been the, uh, uh, developed a long time ago is when the uh, uh, solar, the, the morning ramp may contribute to, uh, to the three hour ramp, uh, the, the resources in, uh, can help the morning ramp in the load. It may help the uh, overall the uh, the uh, three-hour ramp in the 
afternoon. As we showed in the 28 of the uh, class large and dark, we have really down ramping in the uh, after this uh, after the morning ramp, then the uh, we have this down ramp. So this category is kind of maybe outdated in another sense. We can see the, some trend in the next slide. Basically, is hey category one is whatever you have the morning ramp, and category two is the rest, and category three is the the five percent on top. So go next. This is the we have been following this. Uh, uh, doing this category over years, so we uh, we we are doing this uh, again this year. Thank you. So next. So this is we have been showing this is the uh, the primary ramp in the afternoon and the morning ramp. The gap, the left side is morning ramp, and the right side is the uh, primary ramp. The gap over years. This is the uh, uh, getting bigger and bigger. So we, uh, so this uh, kind of showing we need more and more faster in the primary. The morning ramp uh, is shrinking. So the um, that's these uh, two slides, uh, two graphs we are showing. Go next. So. Still follow this methodology of the morning ramp, and we see on the left uh, half of the uh, table, we see this uh, different uh, months have different uh, composition of the morning ramp, afternoon primary ramp, and 5%. So you can see roughly there is a seasonal pattern between the January to April and the November to uh, to uh, December, so that's the um, split we, we can see is kind of small, it's uh, less than 30, 40 percent, but the, in the summer, you have more than 40 percent of the morning ramp. So these uh, really, uh, there were some variations to get a little more, uh, quote unquote, a stable estimated for each month. We are doing this average, just trying to uh, get the seasonal categories, so you can see the summer month of May to September is uh, the morning ramp is uh, uh, before was uh, between 40 to 54. Then if we just say, uh, hey, on the average, the summer is the 46. So this is the uh, kind of little just smoothing technique to get a stable, not really varying too much. Otherwise. Uh, the April, maybe 28%, February 37%, we, since this uh, whole methodology is based on the maximum uh, day, one day of the maximum net load ramp. So it's, it, it is uh, really a need to, to get a little more stable, get a little average. So that's not the really uh, just a smoothing of get the seasonal categories. Thank you, go next. And this is just the, uh, uh, trying to emphasize the more, uh, the, these are the over years, the peaking, uh, the, the primary category increased. Uh, this year is in the uh, May to September. This year, uh, for next year, is 50%. Before uh, 2021, is 45%. And um, the, uh, the, for the, uh, Winter season is a kind of varying between 55 to 63. So the increase of uh, of these primary ramp percentages kind of indicate uh, of uh, the methodology based on the uh, categories based on the uh, morning ramp and the afternoon ramp may uh, need to a uh, kind of rethinking or somehow is a kind of uh, Maybe it should be in the uh, one hour, three hour ramp in that type because the, the main thing is should be focused on the primary ramp. The morning, whatever morning ramp, um, we prepare the resources, we need to ramp it down. So, but still this year, um, we we still uh, follow this uh, uh, methodology. So uh, then the uh, still the primary, uh, the base category, um, 
um, peak category and super peak category, we still have the same methodology. So before I go next, I pause for the question. Okay, so um, next slide, please. Thank you. So this is the uh, after between this uh, seasonal average and uh, this is like a, a, a one way uh, uh, to slice like the a big pie, the orange pie I showed on the very beginning of my presentation is uh, hey, uh, in each month, the base category, you need this much and uh, um, uh, in the peak category, you need that much. Then the uh, then the um, okay, why why you go this slide go up slide? I have uh, almost almost in here. I'm showing slide fifty forty three. I need to go up a little bit. Hello, yeah. Then the uh, go up, uh, go up, go go that uh, go that ball. So that ball didn't move too fast a little bit. Go up. You go down, you're going down. Go up, all the direction, the other direction. Go, go up. Go up. Yeah. And go up, one more. So this is the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the how to uh, select this part. The other way to slice this pie is the next. Is the uh, go next slide? Is how much CPUC contributes? So CPUC, the allocation typically is around 95 percent. So you have five percent uh, uh, um, uh, will be allocated to the uh, kind of smaller for the for the smaller LSEs, and uh, roughly each of the LSEs should expect that they are. Have uh, including uh, uh, CPUC should be uh, expected to have the 25 ish or more or less of the increase of the, their allocations because the uh, profile of the solar uh, uh, increased. So this is the CPUC, and the all the rest of the um, uh, LSD's allocation will uh, also going to send within a week of this presentation. Go to next. So this is the uh, uh, different. Uh, uh, this is different flavor of uh, the more of like the operational, and it's not related to slicing and dicing like the big pie. And this is the uh, when the uh, net load is starting to run in each month. So in January, almost all the days they starting the big ramp in the. Uh, uh, our ending 15, and the wind sun, uh, solar, uh, uh, the day goes longer and longer. The, uh, the, uh, the running starting time is shifting to from 15 to 17. Then it go back to, to the uh, 16 to uh, 20, uh, 16 in the September 28, and October to 24. So uh, September and October is kind of all the ball there, and the rest is kind of summer season and winter season. So there is a seasonal change, uh, uh, kind of show the month of the September and October. So we, based on this, based on the concentration of when the ramping starting to, uh, uh, load start to ramping up in the afternoon, we uh, recommend uh, uh, of the must offer, go to next slide, must offer hours. So, go next slide. Yeah, so you can see the in the summer we uh, the concentration yes yeah, starting from the hour 17. Then the, we must offer is five hours of starting 17 in the summer of uh, in the March and in the uh, summer season and the to August is that five hours in the uh, January uh, February November December is the 15 to 19. And uh, the uh, September is the kind of standard, uh, and October standard by its own. 
they, they have the uh, over 16 to 20. So the, uh, the, the recommendation they offer, must offer hours uh, is the same as before, uh, of, uh, when I said before, it's same as the last year. So no, uh, no uh, change uh, here. So uh, because the, our uh, observed, uh, the forecast that have the, uh, almost this, uh, similar, if not the same, the, uh, the pattern of the studying hours, concentration of the studying ramping, the hours studying to ramping. Go to the next. So uh, this is the uh, uh, kind of put all my uh, talking here into the uh, uh, words and put it right here. In, 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 and you see the, uh, so uh, nothing really uh, new uh, here is, uh, we see the peak category uh, has highly rated this year and uh, kind of expect maybe uh, get heavier next year. So, and we may, uh, of this uh, question, that uh, base category, that type of thing. And pro probably, um, you know, we'll go next. So, I, for, uh, this is for the, uh, uh, the Jessica's topic, uh, I stop for a uh, question for the whole allocation and the moon hours. <clears throat> Thank you. Reminder for questions, you can raise your hand by selecting the hand icon above the chat window in WebEx, or if you join via audio only, please press pound two on your device. Please remember to state your name and affiliation first. You may also send your question via chat to all panelists. Thank you. I pass it to Jessica. All right. Good morning, everyone. This is Jessica Tahari, and I'll be going over the availability assessment hours. Um, so for this year, our um, background and methodology have not changed. Um, this concept was originally developed as part of the ISO standard capacity product, and the goal is to determine the hours of greatest need to maximize the effectiveness of the availability incentive structure. And our hours are determined annually as part of the study, and we publish them um, in the BPM. Next slide, please. So the methodology we use to calculate the system or local availability assessment hours, um, we use the CEC IPER data that we described in previous slides, the manage net load column, and we find the hourly average load by hour by month, and we look at that for the years 2021 through 2025. Um, once we have that data, we then can calculate the top 5% of load hours within each month using an hourly load distribution. So what we do is we, um, for each hour, we find the top 5% of hours. Um, for each month, we find the top 5% of load hours using that hourly load distribution, and that, that helps us determine the AAH for years 2023 through 2025. Next slide, please. So for this year, we do have um, a proposed change to the availability assessment hour season. Um, and the next few slides will have some details going into why we're suggesting this change. But in previous years, we had a two-seasoned AAH. We had winter, which was January through March, and then November and December. And then we had the summer season that was April through October. For years 2023 through 2025, we're proposing the addition of a third season, which we'll call, we're calling spring, which will include the months of March and April only. Um, however, we are keeping an eye on the month of May potentially for the future, um, depending on the, the data for the next couple of years, um, as it might also um, show some shift in potential availability assessment hours as well. But for this study, we're recommending the addition of a third season um, for the 2023 through 2025 AAH. Next slide, please. So some of the reasoning behind that change is we took a look at both the forecast CEC data as well as actual KISO data for the load um, and the top 5% of those hours for March and April. And we found that the, both the forecast and the actuals um, for 2023 through 2025 and then the actuals from 2020. 2019 through 2021, show that the top load hours for the months of March and April have shifted to hour ending 18 to 2022. And historically, these months had um, hour ending 17 through 2021 as their AAH. So the bottom, um, the table I have here on the bottom shows that the top, the count 
Um, the number of times each hour was in the top 5% of the load hours for each month. And this is looking at the 2021 actual load data that we observed at KISO. And you can see that the months of March and April stick out as having the top 5% of load hours in the later hours of the day, particularly hour ending 20 and 21, where the months surrounding it, like January through February, and then um, June, July, August, they have shifted a little bit earlier um, and kind of have more of an agreement among the season um, that the earlier hours are more the top 5% of the load hours, where March and April stick out as having their um, top 5% of load hours out later in the day. So we didn't want to group in these two months with the rest of the seasons as they were starting to shift the top 5% of load hours later, and we want to make sure that we're capturing the top load hours for each month with the AAH. So this is um, one of the reasons we're proposing the addition of the spring season to align with the forecast and the actual data, which are fairly consistent in their trends um, across both. Next slide, please. So uh, we also wanted to show a graphical representation of what we've been looking at. Um, the blue line here is the CEC's 2023 forecast. The green line is the 2025 CEC forecast. The orange is the actuals from 2021, so the most recent full year of actuals we have. And then we also have plotted the actuals from 2019 through 2020, just to make sure that this is a trend that we've been observing over the last few years and not just something that we observed in 2021. And you can see that uh, for March on the left and April on the right, that both the forecast and the actual data all have come into a pretty good alignment and agreement that the top hours for that month are shifting later in the day. And if we would keep these at hour ending 17 through 21, we wouldn't really be capturing that peak load hour as well as the higher load hours that um, follow peak and count as the top 5% of load hours um, for the months of March and April. Um, next slide, please. And so um, this is just a graphical representation, again, showing the count of the top frequency of the 5% of load hours for the month. So both for March and April, you can see that um, it's really those later hours of the day that are really grabbing the top 5% of load hours for March and April um, and kind of stand out as the hour months, the hour, the later months versus the surrounding ones and kind of have been the, the driving force in shifting the AAH to 18 through 22 and creating this third spring season. So I will pause and see if there are any questions before I move on to the summer and winter months, since this is a bit of a um, addition to the AAH. There are no callers in the queue. Please proceed. Okay. Awesome. All right, next slide, please. So this is um, the top load hours for May, June, and July. And I followed the same, same trend as I did for the months of March and April, where I included the 2021 actuals in orange, as well as the 2019 and 2020 actuals in the yellow and the pink dash lines, just to so you can see an idea of how um, the load actuals we've been observing, not just last year, but over the past few years, have either changed or remained fairly consistent. Um, so for these months, it's um, March, May, and June is a little bit, um, you can see that the, the top load hours we've observed have been a little bit earlier in the day previously. Um, however, overall, the summer season as a whole has historically had the top 5% of load hours being in um, hour ending 17 through 2021. 20, so we did keep May and June in the summer season and kept them with the 17 through 2021 20, AAH, but we just wanted to note that we are keeping an eye on these months because we've seen that in um, like 2019 or 2020 when it, the temperatures do get very hot. Um, as you can see in the May 2020 actuals on the top graph and the pink dashed line, that we've actually seen a shift to peak earlier in the day and that load ramps up quicker earlier in the day when the temperatures are extremely hot. Um, so it is something that we're keeping an eye on for the next couple of years as a potential shift to maybe also um, needing a, a shift in the AAH for the, the months of uh, May and June. 
So um, just wanted to mention that that's something we're watching, but we did keep them as 2020 hour ending 17 through 21 for the 2023 through 2025 timeframe. Next slide, please. So wrapping up the month of August through October for the summer, um, you can see that there's overall a better agreement for the most part for these months in the load actuals and the load forecast indicating that the top load hours have been consistently being observed in 17 through 2021. Um, August 2020 was exceptionally hot and you can see that um, again, we peaked a little bit earlier in the day, um, but for the most part, the actuals in the forecast have been consistent with the 17 through 2021. Next slide, please. So this is a count of the top 5%, um, how, many, how many times each of the hours showed up in the top 5% of load hours. Um, and uh, it's really those hours 19, 20, and 21 that seem to have the most um, frequent um, ob observations being in the top percent of load hours for the summer months. Um, and then the AAH of 17 through 2021 would capture uh, the bulk of those top 5% of load hours for the summer months. Next slide, please. So moving on to our winter months of January and February, November and December now, these are our four winter months. Um, we can see that there's also pretty good agreement between the forecast for 2023 through 2025, as well as the load actuals for the past three years, all being fairly consistent in keeping those um, top load hours again in the 17th or 21 timeframe. So we're not going to recommend a change to the winter season. We'll go ahead and keep the AEH for these months of our ending 17 through 2021, um, since there's a pretty good um, agreement from the forecast and the actuals of what we've been observing. Next slide, please. And finally, just to show a quick graph again of the um, frequency of each hour in the top 5%, really we have those 18 through 21 hours that are the, the highest in the month. Um, and then by giving the AAH of 17 through 21, that captures those highest load hours pretty well. Next slide, please. So just to give an overall overview of um, what we're recommend recommending for the AAH for um, next year, um, the 2022 numbers were published last year, so these are final, and it's hour ending 17 through 21 for all months. Um, then for 2023 and through 2025, on the left, we've got the winter and the summer season, which is January through February, and then November and December for winter, and May through October for summer. And for those, we're recommending hour ending 17 through 2021. And as I mentioned before, we are keeping an eye on May um, for a potential shift to the spring season for 2024 through 2025. Um, we'll see how the forecast and actuals look next year and can make that determination. But for now, we're gonna keep May as part of the summer months and, and have it with hour ending 17 through 2021. And then on the right, we've got our new spring season, the recommendation for March and April. You can see that 2021, 2022, I'm sorry, as hour ending 17 through 2021. 20, and then now 23 through 25, we have hour ending 18 through 22 as our recommendation for the spring season. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned before, we have to update the BPM with these AAH. So um, by doing so, we would uh, mention the addition of that spring season, which is March 1st to April 30th, with hour ending 18 through 22. And then the summer and winter months will remain as they are with hour ending 17 through 2021. And then at the bottom there is more information on what Hong presented about the must offer application hours as well that would also be updated. And next slide, please. Um, so our next steps, um, we published the paper and presentation um, on Tuesday, April 12th. Comments for this presentation are due on April 28th, and you can have, there's the um, email there about submitting comments, and then we also have the website about comments as well. Um, and then we are planning to publish our final flexible capacity needs assessment for 2023 by May 17th of this year. And that is all I have. I will pass it back to you, Alexandra. Thank you, Jessica. It looks like we do have a few callers in the queue. Okay. Operator, can you please open the line? Hello, this is Patrick from the Public Advocate's Office. Am I up? 
All right. Um, I was wondering, uh, is, are the availability, availability assessment hours used for anything other than RAIM by the ISO? I'm sorry, where the eight? Can, it was kind of jumbled up at the beginning there. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, I'll start over again. It's Patrick Cunningham of the Public Advocates Office. I'm wondering what the availability assessment hours are used for other than the RAIM uh, assessments hours, if anything. Yeah, so I can take that one. This is this is Amber. Um, so it is used for assessing RAIM. Um, that's one of the things. But one of the other things that you see aligned with AAH hours at times, depends on system condition, is the flex alert process. Um, so you do see some of the flex alert public conservation also aligned with the AAH hours because those are the hours of most need um, to the KISO system. Got it. Thank you. There are no callers in the queue. Thank you. Next slide, please. Before we close today's meeting, the ISO is pleased to announce this year's stakeholder symposium, which will be held in person at the Safe Credit Union Convention Center in downtown Sacramento on November 9th and 10th. Registration for the event will be open in May, and a public notice will be issued once the site is available. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact us at symposiumreg at kaiso.com. Next slide, please. Thank you for joining today's discussion. As a reminder, this meeting was recorded for informational and convenience purposes only. The video file will be posted on the initiative webpage for a limited time after this meeting. We look forward to receiving your comments and have a great rest of your day. Operator, you may now conclude the call. That concludes our conference. Thank you for using event services. You may now disconnect.